All right, good morning. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I, I wanna welcome all of you to Pediatric Grand Rounds. And I understand we have many special guests because this particular lecture is gonna kick off a whole day as part of a, of a conference on child abuse uh, being hosted here with participants from across the country who will be joining us this morning. So special welcome to all of them. Just wanna make sure everybody knows to get your CME credits to use the code on the left and to note that the text code is unique each week. So make special note and we'll make sure it's also in the chat for those of you who are just getting settled in. I wanna call your attention to the next few grand rounds to our schedule. Incredibly excited um, to have Danny Chow speak with us. Danny just joined the faculty in the, in the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology. His PhD is in chemistry and chemical biology and he did his postdoc in chemical engineering um, and bring really exciting sort of chemistry perspective to how do we engineer insulin more effectively. And I've heard him speak and I know it's just, it's a wonderful body of work and we're so excited to have him join the faculty. And then after the Thanksgiving holiday, we'll have a very important talk on hypnosis in the medical setting with Dr. Richard Shaw. All right. And then one of the things that's been quite extraordinary about COVID is the way our entire community has come together to put together uh, educational symposiums. The International Frontiers and COVID-19 Research Symposium was developed by a medical student, Jack Scala in Rishi Medarati's COVID elective course. Uh, Jack developed this research symposium on his own and we're very uh, excited to support it. You can see it's an outstanding agenda. Next slide, please. There's Jack's information on the slide. And the other amazing seminar that's been happening every week um, is the whole uh, COVID-19 in children seminar series where we've really had quite a distinguished lineup of speakers, also something that's recorded and available for our entire community. And our own Hayden Schwenk is gonna give us the latest update on therapeutics. And uh, the pediatrics research retreat will be this spring. I think after a very successful Maternal and Child Health Research Institute virtual symposium last Friday, we're really learning how to do this and do it well mm -hmm. virtually. Um, so gearing up for the pediatrics research retreat in April. So please uh, mark you that date uh, and also uh, uh, please submit your abstracts. The, the interactive poster sessions were really fun last. Okay, I think I'm gonna pass it off to you, Melissa. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Melissa Eggy, who's in the Division of General Pediatrics and a child abuse expert who will be introducing today's distinguished guest. Thank you. I'm excited to be able to uh, introduce Dr. Christopher Greeley. He's the chief of the section of public health and health abuse pediatrics at Texas Children's Hospital. He is professor and vice chair for community health in the Department of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, he's the immediate past president of the Ray Helfer Society, which is an international society for physicians working in the field of child maltreatment. And uh, he is going to talk to us today about controversies surrounding abusive head trauma. Thank you, Chris. I am just absolutely thrilled and honored to be asked to talk a little bit about uh, child abuse, both uh, for this Grand Rounds and for the uh, later on for the symposium. Uh, I'm gonna talk today uh, over the next few minutes on a, a topic that many may not be as familiar with. And it's really this, the controversy around abusive head trauma. So abusive head trauma, formerly known as shaken baby syndrome. What I'm gonna talk about today is really do a brief review of what this disease is and then focus on some of the media and legal debate that has grown up over the past 10 or 15 years and over and look at some of the themes and overview of some of the themes that may that uh, really people have brought up as as almost skeptical that the disease exists. And part of this is I'm going to review some of the published literature, those that is cited to be uh, potentially uh, um, against the existence of abusive head trauma, and then sh sort of show my position on that. And so the outline is I'll talk a little bit about abusive head trauma, some of the features, I'll frame the debate and then start frame some of the themes that some skeptics have brought up. And the theme really has been that these are sort of brought up in court. They're not brought up as in clinical settings. So some of the other ground rules is I'm not going to review every single merit of every theme. I'm not I'm going to use a lot of medical literature because that's really how we communicate, how we understand truths. 
I'm not going to talk about uh, specific people. I'll mention people's names, but I want to be clear that when I mention somebody's name, I'm talking about the paper, not the author, uh, because I don't want people to misconstrue some of the comments that I'm uh, commenting on a person. And then if there are themes that I misunderstand or misinterpret, I really want people to you know, call me out if I'm, if I'm wrong on something. And I start with the take home messages because sometimes I wander down uh, exotic rabbit holes and find myself uh, lost l lack of time at the end. But I wanted to make sure everyone understood there are some important unresolved issues in a, regarding abusive head trauma. But you know, as far as our understanding is concerned, uh, a, a careful appraisal of literature is very critical for uh, our understanding what is good data and what is not good data. There's lots of good information. There's also lots of not good information and lots of misinterpretation. And one of the themes is that abusive head trauma and these cases play out in the media. So I'm going to go through just basically just to sort of level set so everyone's on the same page about what I'm talking about. This concept of abusive head trauma is a framework that by violence to a child with shaking and or with shaking and slamming, the child suffers injuries. Usually these are young infants and the injuries are usually uh, bleeding around the brain. That white area, those white flashes of areas are thin subdural hematomas bleeding that shouldn't be there. But then it also injures the brain. Again, in, when we look at CAT scans, dark brain is bad. And so this is a child that has a lot of areas that are bad and that the swelling of the brain and the injury to the brain is a result of trauma, and that this often ends in fatalities. This is, you can, you can see the difference between the hemispheres and this young child. The child's right hemisphere is dramatically larger than the left, and the child has unfortunately passed away. Another constellation or part of the findings that we see uh, associated with abusive head trauma are hemorrhaging in the back of the eyes. This is the retina. You can't really see the fovea. The macula is obscured, and you can see the, the optic disc, but you can see huge globs of blood. That shouldn't be there. And also folding of the retina. That, that semicircular ring there is what's called retinoschisis. It's a buckling or folding of the retina. Again, from trauma, not supposed to be there. And that this injury can happen immediately. This is an initial CT scan. This is an initial MRI. You can see a little bit of blood at the bottom. And that this, these injuries then progress to brain death or uh, areas of brain death. This is the same child a week later. You can start seeing the frontal regions are getting darker, which again on CT scan often means that there's injury to the brain tissue. And then a couple of weeks later, the brain begins to die away. So this is really the framework that we see with abusive head trauma, that there's violence or some sort of volitional shaking, shaking with slamming, resulting in injury to the brain. And you can also see fractures of the ribs, again, a common feature that we see in young babies who have had trauma against them. And then you can see that on autopsy. Sometimes you don't see them on x-ray and sometimes they're only seen on autopsy. This is a post-mortem ex examination. And you can see quite nicely some linear fractures, uh, transverse fractures of the posterior ribs. And then also we can see fractures at the ends of the bone, often called metaphyseal fractures. That little light little rim, almost like a little halo, is not necessarily orthopedically significant. It's not going to require casting or pinning, but it is, for, it is sort of forensically significant. It is a peeling of the layers of the end of the bone, a metaphyseal la layer, and you can see that is not supposed to be there. Those are some of the features that we see associated with abusive head trauma. And what we also see associated with abusive head trauma is that it usually affect affects babies in the first six months of life. It can be anywhere in the first one to two years of life, but heavily, heavily distributed in the first six months of life, typically clustering around two, three, or four months of age. And that crying is often associated with uh, a triggering event. There is a number of potential triggering events, but crying is a, a well-described phenomenon. This is a paper from Acta Pediatrica demonstrating with the normal average crying that we see in infants and any general pediatrician knows that by the time you get one to two months of age, the child's going to cry more and more, and we, we give anticipatory guidance to parents. But then you can also see that that seems to, to map at next to a, a base of head trauma or shaken baby syndrome curve. And that people do actually admit to doing this. This is somewhat graphic, so hopefully it doesn't trigger anybody. This is a man who admitted to injuring his child quite quickly, quite readily when we saw him in the hospital. This is, this is about 15 years ago. And the prosecutor asked him just to describe what he did. I don't know if you can hear this. 
stop it here. So part of this is to, to recognize that this is a gentleman, this is a tragic situation. He was home alone. His, the mother of the child went to work at three in the morning because she was working at a convenience store and he was left alone. He never took care of a child before. And, and this was a tragic event. He brought the child to the emergency department and immediately said, I think I did something wrong. But the, one of the keys is also that this, there's a history of this disease throughout the medical literature. So this is nearly 100 years ago. This wasn't called abusive head trauma. It was called internal hemorrhagic pachymeningitis of infancy. And what this was is this case series of five kids with subdural hematomas and retinal hemorrhages. And the authors of this paper, again, 100 years ago, before the idea that this was a crime or that this was a disease, a hundred years ago said the most characteristic finding associated with hemorrhagic pachymeningitis was retinal hemorrhages. And so they used to screen when they couldn't do CAT scans and before they'd do a, a subdural tap, they used to screen for subdural hematomas by looking in the eyes to see retinal hemorrhaging. And that the presence of retinal hemorrhaging in a positive fontanelle makes the diagnosis probably practically certain. So again, this was not described as at this point in time, again, almost 100 years ago as trauma, but the disease existed. If you then look at 75 years ago, this was again, John Caffey, who is a, a, a pillar in the field of uh, uh, radiology and specifically as it applies to child abuse. He described six kids with subdural hematomas and had long bone fractures. And so the long bone fractures are, for example, in the first uh, um, frame on the left, you'll see a little metaphyseal fracture. Again, this is 75 years ago, as well as diaphyseal mid-shaft transverse fractures. Norman Guthkelch, who was a British neurosurgeon, uh, described the same thing about uh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, where he had children with subdural hematomas and long bone fractures, and some of them had skull fractures as well. And he said, that this was likely, the concern was that this was from violent shaking. So again, this is all throughout the past medical hit, medical literature as a disease. Many people don't know this person, Clyde Proctor. Clyde Proctor was a young man who was 27 years old, who was living with his girlfriend, who then shook his girlfriend's baby. His girlfriend's baby, um, uh, this was national news. You can see this was first published in 1937 in the New York Times. And then the same day was published in the San Bernardino Sun. And Clyde Proctor confessed to shaking the baby. Again, in 1937, you can see 65, 75, 85 years ago, this disease existed. Clyde Proctor said, the baby bit me. I got mad. I shook it till his head snapped. And then he was sentenced to 20, 10 to 20 years in state prison. So when we talk about this disease, often it's framed that this is a new construct, this new idea. But in reality, it's not. And it was present in the... In the community, this is in South Dakota, the evening Huronite, and they were asking about the case of Clyde Proctor. And then you can see S.W. Sprague says things like this don't happen very often, and the fellow must have been really rough to break a child's neck. I think he should be given some punishment, though hardly rates a charge of murder. So again, this is not a new thing, and that people do realize that shaking is bad. What does it look like today? Here we see a, a relatively recent media piece in which the the person describes shaking the child. He described shaking Lincoln five or six times. This again was in 2019, really started though in 2012. This is a case actually out of San Francisco. And it was one of the beginning cases where there became very prominent in the media that there was questions about this diagnosis. Is this diagnosis real? There was a big media piece on this case as well. And what we've seen over the past 15 years or so is this growing uh, presence of skepticism. And so, for example, in 2014, this expert testified that shaken baby syndrome has been scientifically disproved 
over the last decade. In 2016, the Texas court uh, uh, argued, the, the attorneys argued that there was junk science about shaken baby syndrome. And then even last year, you can see that this idea that there was a controversy, that this disease actually exists. This is uh, a piece written by the father of this young child. This child was killed. And I'll bring this case up over the course of the discussion. But again, the concept really is, if we have this presence of this disease throughout medical literature, throughout history, and those of us who practice, the question is, does it really exist? Is it real disease or not? And not, is it true in this particular case? And not, is it true um, uh, in all cases? But is it a real entity? And so if we actually survey physicians, this was a paper by Narang and colleagues, and surveyed physicians, this was 682 physicians from around the country, and framed the idea of, was this a real disease? And, and uh, identified the fact that most physicians, and I'll go here, most physicians agree that this idea of abusive head trauma is valid. You can see greater than 95% of, of um neurosurgeons and child abuse doctors and ophthalmologists believe it's a real disease. And the, the smallest percentage was radiologists at 88%. So you see the vast majority of practicing physicians surveyed said yes. Now, if you talk about shaken baby syndrome, it's a subtlety where it's really just purely shaking. And then there was some, some skepticism. It has gotten a lot of play. This idea has gotten a lot of play in the uh, mainstream media and this is an example in uh, 2012, the New York Times magazine section had a lead article on the flawed diagnosis. Is it putting innocent people in jail? And this was, again, one of the things I saying that maybe this diagnosis doesn't exist. This is from the Washington Post and Dr. Lance, who's a, a, a ophthalmologic pathologist at Wake Forest, said that it's as scientific as fortune tellers reading tea leaves. Uh, Dr. Wayne Squire, who's a neuropathologist in the United Kingdom, has a TED Talk in which she said she believed it was true until the science showed it was wrong. I have a friend who is a, a national uh, uh, medical writer and did a story for NPR. And she, the, the, my friend received this email from a pediatrician and medical school professor who outlined seven tenets why shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma is not true and ends by saying, in conclusion, I believe shaken baby syndrome is a hoax. So this is a pediatrician and medical school professor in the United States who writes to a national reporter that shaken baby syndrome is a hoax. Many innocent people have had their lives ruined and many children have been permanently removed on a diagnosis with no scientific underpinning. And I'm going to go through some of the things that this uh, author had pro uh, proposed, because I think this does highlight what are the concerns that people who are skeptical about abusive hedron, what are the concerns that they have, and what's the science behind their concerns? And I raise this as mostly being from uh, related to court. In 2013, I gave a talk at the National Shake and Baby Conference, and I said, I believe this not to be a medical debate, but to be a legal debate with a white coat on. And I think this is true. I think that the science behind this is quite solid. And I think that the debate is really, is this true for this specific person? And that's not, that's necessarily, that is a legal debate. And so I'm going to frame some of the areas of skepticism that people may have around the theory of abusive head trauma, discuss some of the supporting literature that those of skeptical have used, and then try and provide some context. And so to do that, I'm actually going to use this off, this uh, um, uh, pediatrician and medical school professor's framework. There are a couple of things that he had written that really did show that he had some concerns. So I'm going to talk about shortfalls, hypoxia, shaking would cause broken neck, shaking is not possible to injure a child. And then I won't get to the very last one. I'll save it for the end because that's a little more nuanced and I usually don't have time to get to it, but I'll include it just in case. So our framework is shortfalls are dangerous, that if a child falls off the couch, that that alone could be fatal. Or hypoxia, all of the findings that we see are simply because a child lacks oxygen. 
And I'm going to give you all the background of why people propose this. That shaking is not gener- uh, dangerous. That it's impossible if an adult were to grab a baby and shake them as hard as they could, you couldn't generate enough force to injure the baby. It doesn't produce the triad, which is a, a court construct of retinal hemorrhages, subdural hemorrhages, and uh, brain injury. And that if you were to do it, you'd have to actually cause neck injury. And if you actually cause neck injury, it would end up with decapitation. And again, all of this is what is argued by people who are skeptical of this tenant of abusive head trauma. The one I'm not going to get to is the scientific basis. And that's really complicated. uh, And it has to do with a misinterpretation of uh, systematic reviews that people have done and meta-analyses. Fringe theories that do come up that I'm not going to touch on are often people will say vaccines cause this. If you if you search for causes of abusive head trauma, you'll find a whole uh, um, underbelly of uh, vaccine reactions as the cause of these things, which, of course, I find uh, moderately preposterous. I don't know if it's possible to say something is moderately preposterous, but I believe that to be true. Vitamin deficiencies is another one that comes very commonly. And then the big one that I think um, I find comical as well is that there is a child protection industry, like big pharma, that that there is a uh, a cabal of child abuse doctors who are making money and retiring to Bermuda because of uh, having this diagnosis of abusive head trauma. And we we, uh, stake our careers on that. And I can think if you talk to anyone who does this work, um, that is uh, comical. So the first, the first contention that is brought up is that shortfalls are fatal. And so you can see here, we go back to this media piece and this, this uh, father, which is, again, a very tragic circumstance, said that he described shaking the child five or six times, pausing and shaking him again, again, readily related to doing that. But actually, if you read earlier on, he said at first he didn't know how he, uh, the child received the head injury. And then he said he dropped the child accidentally while bathing him. And that becomes a very common theme, the shortfall. And so what is often referred to as the killer couch, could a child falling uh, you know, one foot or 18 inches, could they die from that? Because that's, that's really common. That's a common explanation is I turned my back for a moment and the child dropped. And I'm going to talk a little bit about shortfalls and the, the, how fatal they can be and if they can be fatal in what circumstances. And can we distinguish abusive head trauma? from uh, accidental injuries. The cornerstone of the contention that is often brought up is this paper by Dr. John Plunkett, who was a pathologist uh, in Minnesota, who was a pathologist in Minnesota. He unfortunately has passed away. Uh, He reviewed 75,000 consumer product safety records and identified in that 75,000, 18 child deaths from falls. And he presented the data in this paper. And you can see here from from one year to just under two years, there were the youngest kids, and none of those falls were witnessed. But he then said that these fatalities demonstrate, and I'll show you what he says, that, that he concludes that an infant or child may suffer a fatal fall uh, from a fall of less than 10 feet, and that injury is associated with a lucid interval and retinal hemorrhages. And so, you know, this is his conclusion of this paper. And I showed you all the data that that one table is all the data he included. And so it's really important that from this, many people have taken uh, the, the idea that falls, short falls can kill babies. So it's really important to recognize that his study did not include what we would consider infants. Again, uh, up until the, the 12th year of life, starting at 28 days, is an infant. And his study did not include any infants, so his data does not apply uh, to that. And also, none of the babies or none of the children in this series had a lucid interval with subdural hematomas and retinal hemorrhages. So in reality, it doesn't really apply to that content. So this is really the main cornerstone that people use to say shortfalls can kill can kill children. Well, one of the things we know, anyone who's a parent and specifically anyone who's a pediatrician, kids fall all the time. So you can see this is over a hundred years old, this idea that kids fall. Kids fall, they get dropped all the time. And really the, the magnitude in which that happens is best articulated in this study nearly 20 years ago, the, the ALSPAC study, which surveyed 14,000 children of parents, uh, of children that were six months of age, and really asked specifically, at six months, has your child had any injuries in the household? And you can see 
a quarter had fall. So a quarter of all six-month-old kids will have a household fall. Most will have just one, but some will have others. And falling off of beds and sofas is a common thing. That happens very frequently. And so of those, only about 13% or 3% of the total cohort actually had an injury. There were no deaths. There were some skull fractures, which would be expected. And there were a couple that were serious, but less than 1%, fewer than 1%. So you can see the idea that young kids fall is, ha is a real thing. It happens all the time. But do they die from it? Well, these data show that de death would be unexpected. And if you look at data from the United States, the ALS pack was from the UK. If you look at data from the United States on how falls can be fatal, we start back in published in 2004, looking at 2001 data, they demonstrate in the first five years of life, there were 55 fatal falls amongst just over 20 million children as compared to a million non-fatal falls. So in the same cohort, the fact that kids fall is well described. You can see 5% of all kids would have some sort of non-fatal fall. It would re this is ER data. It would result in going to the emergency department. And so if we then look at, here's the data, you can see 55 falls that were fatal to just over a million non-fatal falls in the first five years of life. Again, this idea that kids fall is a very, very common thing. So the question really is, how likely is it that you would die from a fall? And so if you look at toddlers falling on an estimate three to five times per week, which for the most part is an underestimate, it's usually three to five times per day, and they have 200 falls per year. That's 3.2 billion falls by toddlers in the United States every year. If it were in the first year of life, it would be really unlikely. And so you're starting to look at not is it possible, but a probability. Is it possible? Well, of course, a fall can kill a kid. Is it, is it probable? And you can start seeing that we get to these astronomical numbers, one out of 58 million falls. So it's not a yes or no question. It's a probability question. The data were followed up. You can see in 2012, where instead of having uh, looking, comparing 2000 and 2009, this time you break it out by the first year of life. Again, that's the group that we're worried about. That's the most likely abusive head trauma uh, group. And that's also the one where falling off of a couch actually does happen. So how often do you get falls that are fatal in the first year of life? And you can see out of a population of about four and a half million infants, you have about 19 fatalities. So is it possible? The answer is yes. Is it probable? No, it's really unlikely. And so what about higher falls? Are higher falls dangerous? It turns out if you look at data, this is nearly 20 years of data falling out of windows. What you see is in a population of reported of nearly 100,000 falls out of the window, they had fewer than 20 cases that were fatal, and that includes nearly 50,000 falls out of second story or higher. So falling while falling out of a window would not be something I would recommend to a child. It is something that actually is kind of safe if you look at epidemiologic data. You don't really end up you don't really end up with fatalities. So kids can fall, they fall all the time, and fatalities from falls are really, really uncommon. So is there a way to distinguish a accidental injury from abusive head trauma? And really the best paper to describe that is this paper by Mathieu Vinchon, who's uh, from France. They looked at prospectively 45 admitted abusive head trauma cases and 39 publicly witnessed accidents. So the accidents occurred in a public space in front of independent witnesses and confession was obtained from judicial sources after the judicial hearing were made public. And so it's important to recognize France does not have a plea bargain. So someone admitting to do something doesn't actually ever help their case. And so it turns out, can you distinguish between the two? It turns out you can actually distinguish between the two. You see an abusive head trauma, you see greater uh, episodes of, or greater frequency of coma, seizures, and intracranial pressure increases, subdural hematomas, ischemia, intracranial fractures, uh, extracranial, excuse me, fractures, so rib fractures and long bone fractures are much more common. So retinal hemorrhages, it's not yes or no, retinal hemorrhage are just much more common in abusive head trauma, but you can see here they did, they were apparent in accidental injuries, witnessed accidental events can result in a 
a retinal hemorrhage. And then they're more, more likely to die. The mortality from abusive head trauma is, is more, more common. Scalp swelling and skull fractures were less frequent in abusive head trauma and more common in accidents. And then impact, again, a contusion, a point of impact was much less likely in abusive head trauma. And you start getting, if you aggregate their data using a frequentist two-by-two two table, you'll start seeing sensitivity and specificity of, for example, the sensitivity of a subdural hematoma is 82%. The specificity of having a subdural hematoma, or retinal hemorrhages, and no scalp swelling, the specificity is 1.0. Now, I get very nervous at anything that calls itself 100% or zero. So 100% makes me nervous. And maybe it's probably because the sample size was somewhat large. But you're starting to see the positive predictive value of subdural hematomas and retinal hemorrhages. Again, amongst a cohort of clearly abuse and clearly accident, it's a quite dis discriminating constellation of findings. Well, you can see also then the negative predictive value is also uh, not that good. So can shortfalls kill young children? Yes, rarely they can. And if anyone who says it's impossible to die from a shortfall, I think doesn't know the actual data. Adults falling down the stairs while carrying a child, walkers, as pediatricians, we all hate walkers. Walkers are the tool of the devil. We don't like those at all. Bunk bed falls, complex falls from swings and playgrounds, again, in deference to Dr. Plunkett's work, is, I think that's very helpful. And then really, if there's stroke, neck injury, surgical mass. And so usually you'll find cervical spine injury, epidural hematoma. And the question is, is it really a, a mimic of abusive head trauma? And I don't believe it to be a mimic of abusive head trauma. I think you can readily discern a true accidental event uh, from an abusive head trauma uh, event. Sometimes it may be difficult, but I usually you can readily distinguish that. So the take home message is babies fall, they fall all the time. They actually hit their heads all the time, but deaths from falls are exceedingly rare, you know, but you know, to be true, it can actually happen. So the second thing that, um, that uh, our author had proposed as one of the concerns was hypoxia, which for those who are, who are pediatrics, who are trained in pediatrics, uh, and our physicians, you would think that's really, I, I would never have thought that. And, you know, quite frankly, I wouldn't have thought that either. And the premise is the finding that are usually associated with abusive head trauma are actually not the result of trauma, but the result of hypoxia alone. So a child that has an hypoxic event, that alone can result in subdural hematomas, retinal hemorrhages, and uh, intracranial uh, injury. And that alone. And so there are really two main themes. It is hypoxia alone, and I'm referencing a number of papers by Dr. Jenny and Geddes, and I'm going to go through those quickly just to give you a flavor of what the sources of this information are, and then dysphagia, or choking, for those who may not be familiar with the term dysphagia. The genesis of all this was nearly 20 years ago, a series of papers that Dr. Geddes and her colleagues put out where she looked at 53 well-documented abusive head trauma cases with you know, we, you can see that, oh, excuse me, and you can see that 72% were all because of confession or conviction in the court system. And what she did is she and her team looked at the record. So these are kids who were definitely abusive head trauma. They were very comfortable with that. They looked at the records. They looked at the brain. And so this, these series of studies was looking at actually the brain parenchyma, was sampling the brain parenchyma and staining it in a variety of stains. And then she compared infants with children. All of these were, again, victims of abusive head trauma, but then found out that children who were infants had significantly more uh, a, 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 had significantly more apnea or respiratory symptoms and less likely to have scalp bruising or extracranial injuries. Her second study took the same series of kids, took 37 kids from that same cohort, and then looked at 14 additional controls. So we had 37 abusive head trauma and 14 controls from non-traumatic sources. And again, looked at the brain tissue itself. And what she found out was that their findings say that Severe traumatic axonal damage is a rarity in kids with non-accidental injury. So her findings, again, in 2001 was that kids that had abusive head trauma didn't have axonal damage that they would associate with trauma. To that, she added another paper, 50 deaths that were not traumatic. She added three kids with trauma, but 50 non-traumatic. And she was looking at the dural membrane. She was looking at the subdural. And above these 50 kids, most of them were all infants and uh, prenatal, uh, perinatal deaths. 
And only one of these 50 kids, again, looking at the dura, so the first two studies were looking at the brain tissue itself, again, looking at one of the things that is associated with abusive head trauma being parenchymal injury. And the second, the, the third study was looking at the blood around the dura, so microscopic, macroscopic dura. The only one that had a macroscopic dural blood, again, in these young kids, was a 25 product of conception with gram-negative rod sepsis and chorioamnionitis. So that was the only child that had blood that they can see. All the rest of these kids did not have subdural hematomas that could be seen. Uh, um, the eyes were not examined. And so what they ended up saying is that hypoxia was associated had a slight association, excuse me, there was a slight association between intradural hemorrhage and hypoxia. So not a statistically significant, but a slight association between intradural hemorrhage and hypoxia. And that their conclusion was that they suggest that non-accidental head injury retinal hemorrhages would occur from the same reason, but remember, the eyes were not examined. And so this was a, a series of papers in which they said that this hypoxia is responsible for the thin film or collection of subdural blood, and that we suggest that many cases of non-accidental head injury, retinal hemorrhages, occurs from the same reason. So their premise really was, you can see on the left, that historically we believe that there's an injury, and the injury results in scalp injury and apnea and subdural retinal hemorrhaging, and then the apnea leads to hypoxia. Their premise, which is B on the right side, is that you have an injury, the injury results in apnea, the apnea results in hypoxia, and that hypoxia results in intracranial, increased intracranial hemorrhaging and subdural hemorrhaging and uh, retinal hemorrhaging. So thus, you really don't need to have traumatic brain injury to end up with subdural hematomas and retinal hemorrhages. And hypoxia alone leads to the intradural hemorrhage, and that subdurals are not traumatic in origin, but they're hypoxic in origin. And so putting all this together, Dr. Geddes' team has come up, had come up with a unified theory. Again, this is in uh, 2001, 2002, 2003, that abusive head trauma does not result in the findings we typically see with trauma. So the brain tissue, the histology was not similar, was mostly more similar to be what you'd expect to see with hypoxia. And that hypoxia alone is the trigger for subdural hematomas and retinal hemorrhaging. So that really sort of puzzled me. It really puzzled me because I don't think hypoxia alone, I've ever thought of it as a cause of all of these findings. And an example of what we can look at of how I don't believe that hypoxia alone is, is responsible for subdural hematomas and retinal hemorrhages is for something that unfortunately many pediatricians are familiar with. It's near drowning or drowning. It's a pure hypoxic event. It's usually younger kids, infants and toddlers. It's pretty common, unfortunately. It's often quite clear when it happened, and there's a variety of fatal versus non-fatal. And there's actually a study looking at this. This was by Rafat and colleagues out of San Diego, where they looked at um, kids who came into the emergency department in the ICU who had CAT scans, and what they and they had fatal drowning and non-fatal drownings. And none of the kids in their uh, cohort had any blood. Of all the abnormal scans, none of them showed intra or extra axial blood or unilateral findings. Some would show global hypoxia, as would be understood. And then they say that their data describe the absence of hemorrhage and unilateral findings in pure hypoxic ischemic imminence, and that the findings in these cranial CTs differ significantly from those found in kids with abusive head trauma that often do show blood or unilateral edema infarcts. And so out of their 156, none of them had blood inside their head, which gets a point estimate of 0 0.03. I did it, wrote it in red because they didn't calculate it. I calculated it, and I don't want to attribute to them in case uh, they would have a dispute with my calculations. But you can see, could subdural hematomas occur from a pure hypoxic event? Well, you know, it's you know less than one percent would be a possible would be possible. And so, if it's not pure hypoxia, what about coughing and gagging? Because that's the other thing that comes gets brought up with some regular that coughing and gagging does this. And so, I'm going to go back to this case. This was again out of Boston in 2019, published last spring. And if you look at actually the story itself, this is from the uh, news story from the the trial. The person who was being accused of injuring the child said that she was feeding the per the baby a homemade applesauce, the baby vomited, and then she noted the child wasn't breathing. She heard a gurgling noise, saw her face, her eyes were closed, 
and that the child, the the uh, alleged perpetrator, uh, is a was a physician from India, and she did mouth to mouth, but didn't call nine one one, and then the child had died at home, and so. This idea was that coughing and gagging alone, or coughing and gagging could have caused all these findings. It may not be hypoxia alone, but coughing and gagging was the thing that did it. And the first thing that, this was brought up in 2005, again, 15 years ago, this idea that paroxysmal cough could cause vascular rupture. And that actually is what is the mimic of abusive head trauma, what that time was called shaken baby syndrome. And Dr. Talbert, uh, constructed a hypothesis in which a paroxysmal cough injury, PCI, was was actually what was the cause, and that it was impossible to distinguish shaken baby syndrome and paroxysmal paroxysmal cough injury. And so, Dr. Talbert approached Dr. Geddes, and they constructed a, a, a software model uh, that was modeled after a three-month-old physiologic parameters, and then plugged in 600 variables and constructed this software model, which I actually found online and downloaded and played with. It was actually a lot of fun. But constructed this model where you could plug in variables at each of these areas and be able to then see, would you have changes that uh, were associated with coughing? And so what they identified was that if you had a single cough, you'd look at capillary flow or capillary or sinus luminal pressure, intracranial capillary or sinus luminal pressure, you'll see no change. But what they identified was that in their model, if you had paroxysms of cough, you would see cough, 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 cough. And what you started seeing is increasing in the capillary and sinus luminal pressure. And that you'd see decreases in capillary flow, maybe increases in some sort of jugular vein flow as well, but really that you'd see this increasing in intracranial, intraluminal pressure by their computer model. And so that the, they concluded that the results of the study show clearly that conditions for subdural bleeding may occur in otherwise healthy infants, absence of trauma, and that this subdural hematoma, subdural bleeding, would be accompanied by retinal hemorrhaging. Although they do say that no research actually addresses the question of stress failure of the intracranial veins. So they do say, if you actually read the method section, that they don't know when the vessels would pop. There's no data on when they would pop, but they say clearly they've shown that it can pop. Now, I would take this when I first read this, and I thought, well, this is an interesting theory, but I don't know it to be true. And actually, there's a case report of authors that proposed that this was true. And the authors proposed this case report. They, they published this case report, you can see, 10 years ago. It, the case report of a four-and-a-half-month-old baby was fed in a bottle. Father left the room. The baby was blue and choking, tried to do back blows blew into the child's mouth, saw the stomach swell, called EMS. The father ran next door. All of this is in the case report as published by these authors. Ran next door, EMS arrived, the resuscitation was successful, but the child was down, this infant was down for 30 minutes, uh, was pulseless for 30 minutes and hypoxic for over 40 minutes, transported to the emergency department where the child on the initial CT scan was noted to have intracranial bleeding. You can see sub, the arrows pointing to subdural hemorrhaging. And you can even see in frame C that there was, sub, uh, intra, there was um, the retinal hemorrhaging identified on the CT scan. This was done a few hours later. You can see worsening subdural blood and worsening retinal hemorrhaging on the child. And then on the MRI, you can see pools of blood in the back of the eye and cervical spine injury as well. The, the case that they reported had profound coagulopathy. You can see the child had a, uh, 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 was uh, profoundly unwell, bulging fontanelle, neurologically devastated in the hospital, had retinal hemorrhages, and then died at 66 hours. The authors say this is consistent with a history of dysphagic choking as consistently provided by the caretakers. So the authors' conclusions were simply that this child's choking was the cause of all of this stuff, and the child died from the choking alone. The only evidence of trauma was acute unilateral rib fractures that could be related to CPR yeah. attempts. So again, their conclusion was this child had dysphagic choking alone, and this alone was the cause of death. So if we then pass back to our case in Boston, that's what the, the alleged perpetrator and the defense team were, were arguing, that the child had this, had acute dysphagic choking, and that caused the findings that were seen in that child. And that the two important, the two mechanisms was dysphagia caused increased venous pressure, as highlighted by Talbot and Geddes, and that there was hypoxia, and that hypoxia made it worse. But there were a couple things about this case report that were important. 
this was a re- this was a real case. Uh, it, it went to trial. The father was convicted. It was appealed, and that the four authors were on the defense team for this father. And there was also healing rib fractures that were not mentioned in the vignette. And I know that the authors know this because I reviewed the transcripts of all of the authors, and the authors did note that there was healing rib fractures during the during the uh, in their transcripts. And so, as one is right to right to do, I wrote a letter to the editor saying it's. It was interesting that there were similarities between uh, this, this vignette and a case in Texas by, uh, by Xavier Thomas versus the state of Texas. It was a homicide case. And that uh, there were three acute rib fractures, as noted in the vignette on the right, and the seventh rib having additional distinct healing fracture in, the, in a review of the transcript that they were indeed aware of the both acute and healing fracture. And so the pediatrician who cared for this child, this was out of Austin here in Texas, and the pediatrician who cared for this child wrote, a, I think, a a really nice deconstruction of this and included court transcripts in which the the, um, uh, author of the case series talked about the child uh, that he'd seen, that he was the the only case in which they've ever had been reported, that this actually had been reported. And so the, the... pediatrician, the critical care physician, the radiologist, the ophthalmologist, and even the prosecutor wrote to the editor of this. Of this. And the editor's response said, that this is a case study, the issue, issue, the purpose is to present an alternative interpretation of the findings of the case. This is not the presentation of research data, and thus the requirement to present all of the data is not appropriate. Now, I want that to, to, to marinate a little bit. The editor said, the requirement to present all the data is not appropriate. Again, that is really baffling. The editor also then on to say this does not require that all of the facts, I love how facts is put in air quotes, that all of the facts be presented or even that the facts stick uh, to the case as it represents primarily a vehicle for the presentation of the of an alternative theory. And then Dr. Edwards, who is the pediatrician who cared for this child, the, the editor's refi- reply confirms his awareness that the case report omitted facts and the interpretation was biased. Since the inaccurate case report was published, it's been cited numerous times. And so in reality, you can see how these theories of hypoxia or theories of dysphagia as a cause actually has gotten legs, actually has made its way into the court, and people have used it in court. And I showed you all the data that support hypoxia and dysphagia as a reasonable cause, and I think that it's, I'm not convinced that they are actually mimics. And the last couple I want to touch on is, first and foremost, this concept that shaking is not dangerous. And again, if we go back to this case as presented in, uh, from Boston in about 18 months ago, the defense attorneys wrote that an adult or, or argued that an adult cannot vigorously shake a child with enough force to cause a subdural hematoma. You just can't do it. It's, so that's, again, the premise. The premise is that in courts, people will argue that it's impossible to injure a child by shaking the child hard enough. So the first and foremost take home message is there are no, going to be no studies in which we randomly assign infants to be shaken by football players. There are just are no studies. That's not going to happen, thank goodness. So I want to show you what is, what is it that we do know about this. And usually what is used to show that shaking cannot injure a child is this paper by, um, uh, again, this is uh, 45, 40-something years ago, uh, by uh, Dr. Duhaim, again, out of CHOP, who's a neurosurgeon, pediatric neurosurgeon out of CHOP. And what she did, she looked at some cases and looked at some fatalities and, and really sort of thought, wow, impact is really seems to be more associated with fatalities. And if it didn't have impact, it was really not as likely that you'd have a fatality. And so she constructed a biomechanical model of a one-month-old and attached some accelerometers and then did some shaking of some of them and then did some where they had shaking with impact. The shaking alone you know, the forces in her model didn't show high enough. But if you actually impacted, you'd see that the forces would be very much high enough to be scaled to cause subdural hematomas or diffuse axonal injury, which would be parenchymal injury associated with trauma. And so people will cite this as demonstrating it's impossible to shake a baby hard enough uh, unless you have impact to cause injury. But the problem is we have lots of data that shaking is actually bad. And so going back into the 60s, uh, um, Aobamaya took a series of rhesus monkeys and, again, in a somewhat draconian way, placed them in a, a rocket sled and concussed them. This was in, 
looking at, you know, car safety, but it really was something we can learn from in terms of whiplash injury. And what they, he identified was that 15 of the 19 concussed monkeys, so monkeys had pure whiplash, and 19 of them actually were symptomatic, and 15 of them actually had subdural hematoma. So it's possible to shake a monkey hard enough or to have a whiplash of a monkey hard enough to get a subdural hematoma. Again, no impact on these. And eight of them had cervical cord or spinal cord, upper spinal cord injury. And then they include some of the pathology showing that you can actually shake a monkey hard enough because we're not going to shake babies hard enough. And then out of, um, out of Australia, there's a series of, res of researchers in Australia, again, over the past decade, who have shaken uh, rats and now in this model using lambs and have hooked up lambs and then shaken lambs to look at can you actually get injury to the lambs? And this, these researchers actually did sham uh, lambs. So took the lambs, half the lambs got shaken. The other half were control lambs. They got all the same surgery, but actually didn't get shaken. So all shaken lambs had neuronal injury. And then they were, clearly they were sacrificed afterwards. Shaking alone did actually cause subdural hematomas in lambs. Shaking alone was fatal in some. Neck injury was indeed prominent. And so the authors say, although it's debated whether shaking alone can generate impact loading, which is code for you know, enough force to cause brain damage consistent with non-accidental head injury, uh, read abusive head trauma, or whether an additional impact is required, our findings that shaking alone resulted in the death in a subset of young lambs is evidence that head impact is not always needed. And then associated with that is the concept that you could shake a child, but if you shook them really hard, you'd get neck injury. And so, again, this gets brought up with great regularity, usually in court. This was a case out of Texas. Lawyers pointed out that it's impossible to shake a baby to death without causing neck injury, which this child did not have. So, again, I think neck injury is, an, is a really important topic. And you can see six years ago, I wrote a commentary saying, you know, it's really unclear the role of neck injury in abusive head trauma, both as a cause of some of the symptoms as well as uh, a result of some of the injuries. And so where do people come up with this concept that you have to have neck injury, that you, if you were to shake a child, you'd have to see neck injury. If there's no neck injury, you, wouldn't have, you couldn't have evidence that the child was shaken. This is the last topic, and then we'll, we'll pause. Uh, it was a model by Ferris Bandak who used, a, who used a, a computer modeling where he simulated shaking of a child. He used these, uh, what I would, how I interpret mystic ruins, but used biomechanical equations and then came up with this concept that his model shows that you'd have to have, that shaking would result in this sky high injury. What they said in their distribution of force was an 80. But he also then says that what we do know is that there are data showing that if you shake an infant, you'd only get this 445 newtons. And so it was known that if, if you get that much, you would have decapitation. And so that's really what he's saying. So he's saying clearly, if you have my model showing shaking results in 80-fold increase over the 450 newtons, you'd have tons of decapitation if shaking did that. And so in reality, his, his data was based upon this one paper that 440 newtons would cause the neck to decapitate. And really, this paper is from 1874, and I just show you that, just to let you know, I actually did read it. It was, some, it was a very, um, uh, thankfully, a study wouldn't be done now. Newborn babies were taken, put in a device, and weights were applied to their legs until they became uh, disseverment, which basically means decapitation. Now, I'm not going to go into the, anything else about it. But they then said that, that if you added 105 pounds, you would have uh, enough to uh, survive. But once you got up to about 120 pounds, you would produce decapitation. And, and so Dr. Bandak says that shows the forces in my model were much more than that. And so you, you would have decapitation if shaking actually occurred or shaking caused neck injury. And that's why shaking is safe because we don't see neck injury. And he says, given that cervical spine injuries reported to be rare, uh, the results show that the shaking diagnosis of, uh, of an infant without spine injury is questionable. 
And the problem is that his equations were actually kind of wrong. So letters to the editor showed that they tried to reproduce it. These were uh, biomechanical researchers out of CHOP, tried to reproduce it and found that their values were 10 times lower than the ones he reported. And that there's no sin one single explanation why all of his errors occurred. And that it based upon his flawed calculation that they would then say that we propose that more appropriate uh, conclusion uh, is that the possibility exists for neck injury to occur with severe shaking, even without impact. And then if we just quickly go back to Omaya's work, Omaya had, uh, again, 15 of the 19 uh, rhesus monkeys were, uh, had macroscopic findings, and that mounted, and eight of those actually had cervical spine injury. So if you do actually shake monkeys, you get injury. And then there's data in actual young children. This is a uh, post-mortem evaluation, 42 homicides, 79% were abusive head trauma, 70% had cervical spine injury. So in those kids, you actually do see cervical spine injury who are victims of abusive head trauma. Victims of abusive head trauma, 78% had atlantoaxial, atlanto-occipital or nuchal injury. Uh, if it was just trauma, it was only uh, 46%. And if it was non-trauma, it was only 1%. So you, you start seeing subdural hematomas, ligamentous injury in kids who are victims of abusive head trauma. Now, I'm going to quickly go through this because it sort of shows the same thing, that actually when you do look at kids and you do look at postmortem evaluation or MRI imaging, you do see cervical spine injury. A good example is 53 kids under 36 months of age, all with abusive head trauma, all had head CTs, all had MRIs of the neck. Eight of them had uh, cervical spine injury on their MRI. It was ligamentous injury, cord injury with, with an epidural uh, hematoma of the cord or isolated cord epidural. And again, I'm just going to pass this because it sort of shows that when you actually do look at kids who are victims of abusive head trauma, you actually do see uh, spine injury. So the idea that you don't see spine injury is, again, false. And the idea that you have to have spine injury is also false. You can see it. And in, there, in these data, it shows about 50% or so will actually have cervical spine injury. And so really, I wanted to pause here because this is the end and we're at time. There exists a lot of important issues that are unresolved with abuse of hedrum. These were the take-home messages. But if you actually read the literature and the supporting research of what people's contentions are, you can actually, I think, quite clearly appreciate is their um, ability to distinguish some of these concerns uh, from uh, abusive head trauma. I think there, there is a good ability to do that. There's lots of good sources of information. You should read them all. You should have there, some of the sources are good. Some of the sources are not good. Abusive head trauma commonly plays out in the media, unfortunately. My last slide is always one of prevention. One of my dear friends, John Leventhal, would always say you have to end with prevention. So here's my prevention slide, a hat tip to John Leventhal, and I'm ready to take questions or hear a discussion from others who may be uh, interested or having uh, uh, comments. Thank um, you. Thank you, Dr. Greeley. We have um, maybe time for just a question, um, but we do have a lot of compliments on your talk. Um, <laughs> there is one question about lucid interval. Can you yeah. elaborate on that and how that's a controversy? So that's an excellent question. Lucid interval is defined that you, a child, and it's mostly described in adults, uh, the lucid interval uh, is, is um, defined as a child or an adult who has had a significant traumatic brain injury, who then subsequently will have a a period of apparent or documented lucidity, meaning acting normal, and then subsequently collapse and die from that. And so the example would be, and it's been it's described in the adult literature a little bit, what's called TADD, talk and then deteriorate and die. And that idea of having a lucid interval where you would then uh, have a traumatic injury, be fine, and then die, it just has not been described in infants. It just hasn't been described in infants. Now, what has been described is that children who are asleep, for example, taking a nap, may be interpreted as being normal or lucid, but in reality, they're not asleep, they're in a coma. And that's a very different thing. So lucid interval has to be objectively identified as being normal baseline mentition. And so that's really a, a question, you know, could a child then have a, an injury that happened at home and then went to daycare and then suddenly died from that injury that happened six hours ago? That's a really interesting thing, but it really has never been described to have happened in infants. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate your time. We are at nine o'clock.
And I just want to thank you for joining us. And we are going to move on to our child abuse conference. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you thank you all. If people have questions, you have my email address. Feel free to, to, to email me. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.